roles of the presenter, um, which is myself, Darnell Duro, and Ryan Warner. Um, uh, unless expressly stated to the contrary, uh, are not opinion or positions of the Department of Defense, the United States Air Force, United States Army, or any other representative uh, representative entities um, of the government. So basically, what we're talking about is our experiences and not anybody else's. Um, so I really appreciate it, Ryan, for for joining um, my podcast. It's an opportunity to just talk. We've been talking about this for a while, um, and I know from personal experience, um, I find ways to, you know, approach and then avoid, um, and I and I blame life. Sometimes there's real life situations, but I was like, you know, I think this. I think both of us have. Um, interesting stories that need to be be told from our perspectives, and so um, we kind of came up with a, a discussion post, our our topic, um, and you know here we are today to to talk about that, um, our different experiences, our different unique experiences as um, African American males currently serve in this great nation um, in two different branches. So the tale of two cities, the perspectives of two black military psychologist so without further ado ryan uh, I'll let you just kind of exp- you know who you introduce yourself um and what you do and then we'll get started yeah thanks so much darnell so my name is ryan warner i am a licensed psychologist a speaker speaker researcher and consultant and i'm really passionate about the area of diversity i'm passionate about military psychology as well as uh, comorbid substance use conditions among marginalized populations so I think it would help to start with a story just by myself and, you know, my upbringing and how I got to, you know, my, my current role and what I do right now. So I was born in uh, July 1991 uh, in Chicago, Illinois, and in, high, in, in elementary school as well as uh, middle school, my mom, she, I just had a conversation with her recently about this, but she was very she she didn't really know what to do when it came to supporting my education uh, because my teacher would always tell my mom that I was falling behind in school that I was experiencing behavioral issues and I wasn't paying attention and she ultimately you know was was like hey you know Ryan I, I think I need to put him in a in some type of supportive education so we he won't fall back behind you know his his, his schooling. Um, so as a single parent, she she raised me and my brother, um, and you know my father. He was also there as well to to help support us and you know make sure that we're successful academically because that was really important. You know I come from a family of academics. Uh, my mom's a teacher. Uh, my dad was a principal as well as he was in uh, you know higher leadership opportunities as well uh, during his career. And you know they they really stressed the importance of having a strong education because if you create your education and strong education. And improve your likelihood that you'll be successful in life, right? Yeah. So, in my in my middle school, you know, I, I remember it was a middle school, and I, I went to a predominantly like white middle school, mm-hmm. and I was always wondering like why I'm always you know being pointed out, you know. Um, and my mom always told me that as a black male, I have to work three times as hard than anyone else, you know, to succeed. So what she did is she put me in supportive you know, academic programs. I went to tutoring. I learned how to you know, improve my reading and verbal skills. And, and ultimately, I was able to get through that middle school and the elementary school you know, experience, even though it was challenging. And then I was in high school. I went to high school. And I remember that my, I always wanted to go to the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, because that's where a lot of my family went on my dad's side. Uh-huh. And I remember my high school counselor told me, Ryan, you're probably not gonna get into the school. Your, your grades aren't good enough. You know, you should p- put your standards, lower your standards down a little bit, you know, go to a community college and then hopefully you can Stop you know, get to that it. school later on. Really? Yeah, so with, yeah, with that, it was, it was very discouraging because I was like, hey, you know, I know I, I have average ACT and SAT scores. You know, I know my grades aren't that great. I really didn't do anything extracurricular except for play sports. Um, I played basketball, football, cross country and track, but I wasn't really part of any, any other organizations when it came to right. that. And at first I was kind of discouraged, but I said, hey, I'm still gonna shoot my shot. I'm, I wanna get into my dream school. This is a, a huge big 10, you know, top tier university you right. know, in the nation and I'm still gonna shoot my shot. So I remember for some reason I had confidence in myself, even though some individuals tried to take that confidence away from me. And I remember I told people that I got into the University of Illinois even before I actually got my acceptance letter. 
And I don't, I'm looking back, I think about like why that was, but I, I felt that I was destined for something greater. I was mm -hmm. destined to, you know, accomplish my goals that I had at hand. And luckily I was able to get into that school as well as other uh, very real good schools. However, um, when I went there my, my freshman year, I was so excited, you know, to, to look around and, and to see that, hey, I, I made it, you know, I, right. I, I felt that I made it, you know, walking around campus. And I remember it was like my first, my first semester. Uh, this was 2000, about like 2009, 2010. And I remember I was walking with one of my black friends and there wasn't a lot of black people who went to the school. This is a huge, predominantly white, you know, 40,000 plus, you know, university. Right. I remember we was walking and somebody screamed out, you niggers. No. Out, and, and then they just, they just drove off. And after that, I realized that I probably want to be as welcome as I thought I would, you know, at yeah. the university, <laughs> right? Wow. Uh, and and throughout that, that that undergrad experience, I think it was very challenging for me, like academically, because my first two years, I was undecided. I had really no clue what I wanted to do. I was really passionate about like health and sports. And I thought I wanted to do more the kinesiology route or maybe mm -hmm. be an engineer because I love to be creative, you know, but my first two years were undecided and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And also I was on academic probation. Uh, okay. So I, I came into the university on academic probation <laughs> okay. because I, I failed one of my classes uh, as a senior. I guess I had uh -huh. senior writers. So I, I don't know what happened. But they said pretty much if you get under like a 3.0, you're going to get kicked out of this institution. Wow. And that was that motivated me. But it was kind of scary, right? It was like anxiety provoking. Right. And I remember one of my classes, I, I, I got like a B instead of like a, a B plus, which I needed to have that 3.0. Right, right, right. And I got like a 2.9, 2.99. Mm. And I remember that I was at my dad's house at this time and I got a letter in the mail and I was so fearful that that letter was like, Ryan, you're going to get kicked out of this university. Right. And I opened the letter and it said, congratulations, you're off academic promotion. And I, and I was so, I was so confused because I was like, well, they said I had to have a 3.0 and I have a 2.9. Uh -huh. And they said they recently lowered the standards that you just have to have a 2.5. And I was <laughs> And I was just like, wow, this is a huge blessing. Like, and right then and there, I knew that God had a bigger plan for me uh, because yeah. that, that, just, that doesn't just happen by accident. Right. You know, uh, I would have been kicked out of the university back at home. So after that, I started to take my academics a little bit more serious, you know, um, and that was a huge, a close call for me, but motivated me to, to be better, to do more. Right. So I realized that I went to do community health and I started, I declared, I claimed my, man, uh, my major and part time, I worked as a physical therapist technician. I'm okay. um, doing, you know, working with physical therapists at a local, local agency. And I realized that I was a really good listener. I had a lot of patients that I worked with. We were at the mirror and we were doing stretches and I was trying to enhance their, their physical, you know, abilities. And if they, right. after they had an injury or disability, right, right, et cetera. Right. and a lot of them told me about all the challenges that they go through at work. Yeah. They told me about all of the, the issues they have at home and school. And at the end of our sessions they say wow you know i really appreciate you going through the exercises with me but i really appreciate you just listening you know and i actually feel a lot better i've been it and i got that off my chest and i know this isn't like a psychotherapy session you know but i really appreciate that and after that i realized that hey i think i want to be a psychologist i want to be maybe a counselor or therapist because you know i, I was really passionate about learning from their experience and also right. just giving them strategies and advice and how to improve their well-being yeah. So my senior year, I was like, hey, I don't know what I want to do yet. I know I want to be maybe a counselor, a therapist, a psychologist. Uh -huh. Maybe I need to continue my education. Uh -huh. So I had one of my mentors say, hey, you should go into rehabilitation psychology. And at that time, I had no clue about what that was. But uh, if you're not very familiar about that, rehabilitation psychology is a focus on disability and helping individuals with disabilities obtain competitive employment and improve their overall well-being. So with that, I was like, hey, I think this goes well with, you know, the physical therapy stuff that I'm doing and my interest in health, you know, and helping yeah. people. So let me go that route. So I applied to the University, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison as well as some other schools. And I got into my other schools, but the University of Wisconsin-Madison, they gave me a full fellowship. And I was like, hey, I'm definitely going to continue that. You know, they, they pay me, you know, a salary to go to school. And all I have to do is go to school, you know, and Great I was like, hey, this is... A, from master's degree, correct. Nice. Uh, and, and in my undergrad degree, I also got scholarships as well that I, I had no debt in my undergrad as well. Um, so I was like, hey, let me let me keep going. You know, um, they're going to pay for my school. It's a great opportunity. Another Big Ten, you know, university. So <clears throat> right after my undergrad experience, I went to my master's program. And right then and there, I realized that 
the University of Illinois is not that much different than the University of Wisconsin-Madison when it comes to racial discrimination and overt right. and covert discrimination. Right. I was called the N-word at the University of Wisconsin-Madison more than I can remember. Um, wow. I can't count on, on both of my hands how many times that wow. when we, me and my friends went out at the bars and went to parties, it was extremely overt there, even more than University of Illinois, uh, which was surprising to me. Uh, so I experienced a lot of overt discrimination there, but I, I saw support. I reached out to the Black Student Union. You know, I'm a, I'm a Phi Beta Sigma. I pledged an undergrad, so I reached out to my, my chapter there, and they were really supportive, and, you know, I made some really good lifelong friends there. And I was able to get through that experience, and my last year, I was like, hey, I think I, it was only a two-year program. Um, so going into my second year, I was like, I want to maybe continue my education to be a psychologist. So I learned to be a psychologist, you have to get a PhD or a PsyD, you know, they have a doctoral degree. Right. I was like, that's a, that's a huge feat for me, you know, um, like thinking back, I mean, I was going to be put in special education classes. You know, a yeah. lot of people thought that I wouldn't even get to the University of Illinois for my right. undergrad. How can I get my PhD? Yeah, but ultimately, you know, reaching out to my family, my mom, my dad, my, my brother, you know, um, reaching out to my family, they, they, they gave me confidence to, to keep going. Mm -hmm. So I applied to some a lot of schools and um, I got into yeah, most of my schools and Marquette University was on the top of my list um, because there was a smaller school and I wanted more intimate discussion. I wanted to have a more intimate community because I went to these huge Big Ten schools and I felt that sometimes I was just a number, you know, right. um, and, and I wanted to have you know more connections. So right. I went to choose a smaller university and ultimately they actually gave me a full fellowship as well. And they told me that uh, there was a that new diversity fellowship and they only give it to one PhD student in entire university. Yeah. And I was like, hey, I need to shoot my shot. Hopefully I can get it, I can, I can get it. Yeah. And I remember that I got that notification that I got that fellowship for four year fully funded. You know, they pay you a good amount to just go to school and you don't have to worry about getting assistantship or anything. And I was like, wow, that's a huge blessing um, that, that I was chosen for that. So I was like, I'm not gonna take I'm not gonna take this for granted. You know, I'm gonna make right. sure that this university is, is, is putting hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars into me. Um, right. and, and even though I don't have to do anything, even though I can sit back, go to class, go home, go to sleep, I wanna make, I wanna make a mark at this university. Right. So once I went there, I started, uh, I started support groups for men of color. You know, I was involved in different organizations. You know, I was part of APA as well in leadership positions, you know, across the nation. And I, I found my way, I found what I was passionate about. Right. And ultimately, it was creating a more inclusive environment and creating change, you know. And with that, I got into different research as well. I was assistant, um, like a professor, you know, not uh, well, uh, uh, adjunct professor. Right. Um, I, I worked in different research studies. I had a lot of great opportunities to really figure out what I wanted to do in life. And I remember the second year of my my two out of four years that I was there. On uh, the second year. I went to my wife, well, my girlfriend at the time, she's my wife now, um, right. but my, I went to my girlfriend at the time's her family reunion. And when we went to her family reunion, I was able to meet her family that I never met before. And one of her family members was a clinical psychologist in the army. And he was like, hey, yeah, you're, you're getting your PhD and I think you'll be a good candidate for the military. So I was like, hey, well, tell me more about it. I had, I had no clue about the military. You know, my, my, both my grandfathers, they served in the army, but right. uh, I really didn't talk to them about the experiences that much. You know, their experience is totally different than being like a psychologist in the military. Right. They were in war, you know, et cetera. And with that, I was, I learned from experience. I learned about the phenomenal leadership opportunities he got, about how he was able to start off his career, you know, at a, at a really elevated, you know, position and being, and, and just be able to travel and, you know, the salary that he was offered, you know, in the internship was like three, four times what you'd be offered on a typical internship. And I was like, hey, right. let me let me look into this. Right. So I remember I did cold calls. I called all the Army sites, okay, all the all, all Army internships. And when I called one internship, I was like, hey, I'm interested in the Army. I want to be a psychologist. And, and one um, individual, the Lieutenant Colonel that I spoke with, she was like, well, you know, this is an Air Force internship, right? <laughs> so I called the wrong number. <laughs> and Man, I, was like, oh, I, I hate that you called that number. <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry. And I was about to hang up. She's like, wait, wait a second. You know, tell me about your experience and tell me about your background. I ended up talking to her for literally an hour. And she was like, wow, you have a phenomenal story. I, I want you to actually apply to the Air Force, <laughs> uh, Air Force internship. And she was like, we have this phenomenal scholarship called the Health Profession Scholarship Program. 
And with that, you know, they give you additional money. I know you're getting funded right now in school, but they'll even pay you even more money to just be in school. They give you money for books. And then after that, it improves your likelihood to go to internship. So I was like, and she was like, you have one week to apply for this. You have to hurry up and apply because it's about to close. So I hurried up and applied for it and I got it. And then right then and there, I was in active reserve in the United States Air Force. And <laughs> I see your face. I know you maybe wanted me to do the army, uh, but uh, I thought the Air Force was a, a good fit for me as well. Yeah. And, you know, I heard, I talked to a lot of army people. They was like, well, good thing you went to the Air Force. And I, and I wondered why people said that, <laughs> you know, but maybe it's a cultural thing. I don't know. Maybe you can tell me, but. <laughs> so, 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 so let's, let's, I think, uh, did you say 91? 91. You was born in 91? Oh, when I was born. Yes. Yes. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right, man. I didn't know I had 10 years on you too. So, um, so, so it's interesting, right? We have very similar um, backgrounds to a degree and our story to get to Marquette, um, I think uh, is, is also a very interesting one. Um, for, for as me, I didn't go straight from undergrad to grad school uh, to, to, you know, to my doctoral program. Um, but I, I think one of the things that y you were fortunate to have growing up, right, was was parents who um, have been exposed and they're, they're also um, were exposed to academics and education. Um, and, you know, so they kind of they guided you on that path. I think um, growing up in Compton, my dad enlisted in the service when I was a kid. I think it was like pre-K or something like that. So I did pre-K and kindergarten at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. Um, so it was there for, I don't know how long. And then from El Paso, Texas, we came home, I think I was like maybe second grade for, uh, and, and I think as, as I think now, um, now being in the military, I get, we were waiting to probably clear to go overseas because the next duty assignment was in Germany. And this one was still East and West Germany, right? Um, so it's 1987. I mean, I'm, I'm a kid from Compton living in Germany, in West Germany. Um, and, you know, it, it was a total culture shock, right? That's kind of, kind of what I grew up. I, used to, I grew up, um, academics and education was very, very important. My mom, you said, my mom didn't go to college. Um, and she's always telling me at an early age, now that I think about it, she's to tell me two plus two equals five, right? I was like, no, mom, it's four. She said, that's why you got to stay in school so you can help mommy out. Uh, so that was kind of like my motivation. And now with my own kids being 11 and 12 and they doing common core math and everything, I feel like my mom all over again. I'm, instead of saying two plus two is five, I'm like looking up Google trying to find the answers for them. Um, but, but anyway, um, and then so after, after living in East and West Germany, or West Germany, we came back and he was stationed at uh, felt, felt Fort Belvoir. And then he was uh, got assigned over to the Pentagon. So I remember my dad had like CQ or night duty. Um, and I had a football game, pop one football game the next night. And at this time, it was like, you know, bring your kids to work, right? So I had a sleepover in the Pentagon um, while my dad was on duty. So that way he can, you know, the next morning when he get off, he could take me to my football game and I wouldn't be late. And then I never forget that morning before we left, um, George and, you know, George, George, President Bush and his wife were getting off Mar Marine One right there, you know, in the garden of the Pentagon. And I'm like, sitting, now that I look at the, the thing back, like, man, I slept in the Pentagon and I seen the president maybe a hundred yards away. Um, but in hindsight, that was like preparing me for the exposure piece to um, I would say future because then when my dad got out the military in 91, we went back to Compton. And so I was so used to always, you know, being in school, doing the summer breaks, you know, wasn't playing basketball, or football, with my friends, I was reading because we came back to school in the fall. If you read so many books, you get Pizza Hut or Domino's coupons. And I always loved pizza. So, I, you know, I wanted to, 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 to get those Pizza Hut or Domino's coupons where when I came home, in sixth grade, it was a culture shock where, you know, kids in school were talking about sex. They were talking about smoking weed. They were talking about, you know, kids who was going to juvenile jail during the summer months. Um, kids who got caught stealing. Like, oh, it's just, it, it blew my mind. Even though I was from Compton, it's a part of Compton I wasn't exposed to. Um, and then so I never forget the Super Bowl was, was in L.A. in 1992, I believe it was. Uh, and then so the NFL threw a 
dumped a lot of money into the inner city of Los Angeles. And then so in Compton on Rosecrans and Central, where I grew up at, uh, the west side of Compton, they had a NFL Yet Center. And then so my seventh grade year, summer, none of my friends went to juvenile jail. None of my friends got in trouble that summer because they had like a computer lab. It was either at the, every single day was at the NFL Yet Center. The computer lab, they had like this nice turf field in the backyard or in the back of the center. We just played football out there every single day. Um, but then the next summer, they got rid of it. And then my friends start going to, you know, people start getting in trouble again. And at that moment, I knew that I wanted to do something to give back to my community or help individuals um, because I, I didn't know why, but it was that experience. And even when I applied to my master's program at Alabama State and then even applied to my doctoral program at Marquette, part of your, like your personal statement, I always go back to my, my eighth grade year. And that's when I realized that I wanted to be a helping professional. Um, psychologist, I don't want to be a psychologist then. I, I didn't know. Um, but I knew I wanted to get back and help because of that experience right there. So then I went from my public middle school into an all boy Catholic school um, at Bourbon Day High School, very small, but it was adjacent to the Nixon Gardens housing projects. Um, my dad went to the, the school, and then so I was there. It's kind of like legacy in a sense. But I, it was football, football it was football. And then all my friends who, not all my friends who went to the public high school, was, we just took different paths. Now, a lot of folks that went to the public high school, um, they're doing great and doing phenomenal, right? But for me, I think it really, really benefited me going to Bourbon Day and staying there because um, some of those friends from Bourbon Day are like lifelong friends to this day, but it prepared me um, to go off to college because a lot of the teachers that were at Bourbon Day were also first generation college students or college graduates. So there was really instilling us the importance of applying and going to college and doing well. Um, you, you speak of the University of Illinois, one of our uh, alumni, Hardy Nickerson, he used to actually, he's, I think, um, he's on the staff at the University of Illinois. Um, I think it was like a linebacker coach or something like that, but he played at Bourbon Day at my high school. Then he played, he had a successful, NFL career for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, and then, so anyway, I just, you know, just that Illinois connections. We have a whole lot more con connected um, being from, you know, Illinois and me from California. And then, so, um, so, so anyway, so that was kind of my story of why I knew I wanted to do something to help out. So when I went to college, something else you said, like you went to school on academic probation. I graduated high school like a 3-5 National Honor Society, but I was a horrible standardized test taker, right? Um, I think I, I I even drove, I took the SAT like maybe eight times between my, my junior year of high school to my senior year, because I played football in high school, but I mean, I wasn't a never D1 prospect, right? Some like D2, D3, um, but a lot of coach, I needed a certain, you know, SAT score in order to be even potentially have an opportunity for any type of scholarship, partial scholarship. But I just, I never really understood how to do, study and prepare for those um, standardized test scores. But real quick, funny story. I actually drove way out to uh, Palos Verdes, very predominantly white community. I was like, well, you know what? In my mind, right? If I go take this test for all these white people, maybe, you know, it'll rub off on me and I'll have a better <laughs> score. <laughs> Bro, I got the same score. <laughs> so, so I realized that wasn't the case. Um, but anyway, so I ended up going, I was in, I was actually enlisted in the military because I went to a junior college my senior year, after my senior year at Compton College. And I was playing football. So I really wanted to continue to play football. Um, but after like a two or three weeks there, I realized that this 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 environment, this culture wasn't for me um, because it was very football centric, very football dominated first. And I was like, hey, coach, what about our class? Oh, don't worry about that. We take care of that for you. No, no I'm not saying that because I, I want to go back one day and teach at Compton College. Um, but that experience alone wasn't what I needed. I don't know who that coach was, you know. Um, and then so I was like, you know what? I'm just joining the military. You know, I had a passion for the military. My dad was in the military. Um, I, and people like say, hey, if you're going to join the military, join the Air Force because they have, they have better facilities you know, yeah, compared to the army, right? But that <laughs> said, during during the Gulf War, you know, the Marines were the first ones in. The, you know, the, the grunts they're not they're gonna get the, all the horrible stuff. And then it's the army. Um, you know, you may have a tent with no AC, but you know, and no TV. But the Air Force is gonna have a bubble tent, air conditioned room, satellite TV. You know, they're gonna have all the greatest. So he's like, join the Air Force. So, but the Air Force didn't have a job that I wanted. 
so I saw an army recruiter and like most army recruiters, he sold me. Um, so I took my ass bath and I was getting ready to sign, but I told my best friend's mom, I was like, hey, I'm gonna join the military. She was like, what? And this is the time, you know, um, Boys in the Hood wasn't too far removed from a lot of us. And it's like, you know, no, you ain't going to college. Black men have no business in the military. Um, we're not fighting a white man's war. And a lot of people would tell me that. And it's like, you want to college? I was like, well, you know, I, I did apply to a lot of Cal State schools, but I was like, I want to leave the state of California. I want to get out. She said, well, you're going to go to Tuskegee with your brother. I was like, but he's leaving in two weeks. So, so what? So I actually applied and I got my acceptance letter the, the day before we were leaving to go to Tuskegee. And then, so again, 3.5 GPA. So I, I love school. I love learning, but it's horrible test taker. But my freshman year in college, I had a one point, I think two, my first, my first semester. And then the second semester had like a two something. But anyway, at the end of the year, I had a 1.8. So I was on academic probation um, my sophomore year. So I had no, I had no federal, no student aid. It was a, it, it was a, it was a, you know, um, a change experience to say the least. I started working, I had to get to be a job, worked at Sam's Club. I realized that manual labor, hard labor was not for me. I uh, worked, worked at the dog track. I realized that I had to, you know, I had to be able to get myself where I'd get to myself in a position where I did not have to do this for the rest of my life, um, where you have individuals, great people, um, but you can talk to all kind of way. And I was like, Man, I, I, I can't, I can't do this. Um, so that kind of motivated me. And then my grandma passed away my sophomore year in college. Um, and I was the first grandson. My grandma had 12 kids. My mom's the 11th of 12. Uh, so I had like over 60 cousins and stuff like that now. Um, but I was the first grandson to go off to college. You know, and I had two little brothers looking up. I was like, I got to do something. So still graduated in four years, having been on probation my freshman year, still graduated in four. And then I, you know, decided to go to graduate school, went to grad school at Alabama State, get my master's degree in counseling. I used to want to be a, so I have my undergrad in social work, so I wanted to be a social worker. And next year, I, got, I, I mean, I did a counseling thing. I started working in corrections in the state of Alabama, um, and I was really enjoying it. But after maybe five years of working as a mass level therapist, and I had my own little business on the side where we were doing in-home therapy, and through we were build, was building, I was able to build Medicaid with a, with a master's degree, and I had what 13 part-time employees with master's degrees, and but I like I wanted to do more, and a lot of the policies um, and you know in the prison system was written by Dr. Ron Cavanaugh, rest his soul, um, who was a PhD. I was like, man, what is this PhD? And I never forget talking to one of my good buddies, Brandon Lewis. He was like, you ever think about? He said, think about this, Darnell Duraw, certified anger management facilitator, because I was doing anger classes as well, PhD, licensed psychologist. I was like, man, I'm not going back to school, taking out more student loans. He said, they'll pay you to go to school. I said, what? They'll pay you? <laughs> and it's, that's when I did, you know, your cold call for the military. I did a cold call email um, to every single counseling psychology program in America. And those, it said, hey, I had a nice letter, said, this is who I am, this is what I've done, and this is what I want to do. And those schools will reply back, oh, thank you for your email. Here's our website to our school. Let us know if you have any questions. I deleted them. Those that say, hey, I like what you wrote. Let's talk. Okay, consider box. And then a month later, I got an email from Dr. Todd Campbell, uh, who was my initial advisor. Say, hey, I really like, when can we talk? Can you send me a CV? I was like, what is a CV? So I had to go Google CV. Uh, and I said, all it was was extended, you know, send extended resume. So I created one like in a couple hours and I sent it to him. He and I talked, it was supposed to be like 10 minutes, it turned into like two hours. And the next thing you know, he's like, hey, when can you come up here? I was like, uh, I don't know. And then, I, you know, he put me in contact uh, with some people at the school. I was up there in a couple months toward the campus. I was like, man, only thing I knew about Marquette was D Wade, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I, that's how, that's my story to Marquette. And then when you talk about getting involved, um, I, I think that was my first time in a PWI, predominantly white institution, having went to two HBCUs in a predominantly black and Hispanic high school, I felt like I was like, I don't belong in here. And then some of the stories that you you, you mentioned um, at, you know, as your undergrad in grad school, I never forget going to the library. We were checking out the books and one of my, my, my cohort members, um, she went first and they offered her a bag for all her books. And he just, when it's my turn, I was like, yeah, can I, I was like, can I get a bag too? The guy just at the library just slid me a bag, you know, like, hey, like do it yourself. And at that point I realized if I 
if I'm getting treated like this, I'm sure other people around here who look like me are getting treated like this. So what can we do? So one of the things I think I got with DJ Todd um, and Dr. Wilburn, and we created um, a, a graduate, uh, a black graduate student association, something like that. Um, I don't know if they were still going on when you were there, because I know Erica, Eric, Erica McKinney uh, kind of took the rings with it a little bit. And once I left, but I felt a sense of belonging. So I got with some black uh, students in the dental school, some black students, undergrad students. It was like a mentoring thing. I never forget we had uh, kind of like a workshop where I think um, Professor Professor Fuller, um, is his name Dr. Fuller? Um, I think he's he's in the education. I forget. I forget. It was Dr. Fuller, Wilburn, and so, a couple other. And then we had a, uh, a psychologist in the clinical psychology program, and they were on our panel. We had a discussion on race. Um, and I tell you, man, being at Marquette, I love that institution. Um, and it was just, that's, that's my story to get into the military. Right. And then I was already in the reserves. I was enlisted and that I had became an officer in the reserves. So I was, I was drilling on the week, once a weekend, but I knew nothing about the active duty psychology program until I went to Bullock, my initial, you know, officer basic training. And I'm, I'm here with all these, um, you know, interns who are coming straight from the streets into the military. And they was telling me about the pay you're getting on active duty as a captain. I'm like, what, this little lieutenant could become a captain like this? And I knew exactly what my time in service, what it would look like. So I was like, you know, I'm gonna apply, but I'm not, I, I wasn't HPSP, so I didn't have to apply to all the sites. So I only applied to the, the warm weather sites because being in you know, the Midwest for a couple of years, I was like, I'm not doing the code again. Um, so that's how I ended up coming on active duty and, and being a, you know, started my internship. So. I think we have some similar stories, man. I think that was, yeah. I, I didn't know that about you. That's awesome, dude. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> It's interesting. I mean, it's not like a straight path, you know, and yeah. And often when I when I talk to different groups, especially like students, you know, I say it's OK, like if you don't know what you want to do, you know, yeah. ultimately, you know, life is not like a straight trajectory. You know, there's, right. there's going to be different curveballs in there. But, you know, ultimately follow, following, you know, what your passion in, what will motivate you. Yeah, is, is, is going to get you in the right track. So. So I, I think this it kind of my first question that I have. Right. I know we want to talk about kind of, you know, Tell the two perspectives, you know, black male psychologists in the, in the military, imposter syndrome. Did you ever experience imposter syndrome at Marquette or even at in undergrad or graduate school? I mean, I think everybody experiences that, you know, I mean, even right now, you know, ultimately, I mean, as a licensed psychologist, people look at me and they don't like when I say I'm 29 years old, you know, people look at me like, oh, how's he a psychologist with PhD, you know? Um, so even right now, you know, uh, <laughs> I experienced that. And I think that's an ongoing, you know, challenge that we have to, you know, work through. But, but ultimately, you know, just believing in yourself, understanding that you do have something to offer, yeah. and you do have an expertise based on all your schooling and your experiences and you know your knowledge base. You know, you you bring that to different platform platforms that you work and live in, and and ultimately, you know, just trying to be confident in yourself. That that's something that you know takes time. But ultimately, I think I'm improving my confidence the more experience I get. Yeah. But but I feel like, yeah, everybody experiences imposter syndrome and so I have a perfect remedy to overcome that. But, you know, you know, um, I appreciate you sharing that. I, I didn't really know what imposter syndrome was until I got to Marquette. Because um, I think. Once you become comfortable in something, you know, you're in a, a space of, you know, things that are familiar to you, you know, you, you don't really have to step out or, you know, um, step outside your comfort zones. I think for, for me, imposter syndrome comes when I'm stepping outside my, my, my comfort zone and I, I'm fearing rejection or feel of failure or feel of not fitting in in a sense, right? So my freshman year, when freshman year, my first year felt like freshman year at Marquette. Yeah, I was the only black male, right? Um, black male for, had not been in school for five or six years. Uh, I never forget, like, a couple nights before school, I went to Walmart and got all my, and this is, Walmart's not endorsing this or sponsoring this podcast, um, but I went to Walmart and got, like, all kind of, like, my paper, my pens, my notepads to take notes, right? Because when I was in school, that's what we did. We took notes on paper and pencil. When I came to class, everybody had, like, little MacBooks, computers, taking notes on the computer. I was like, whoa, what's going on here, right? And then the conversation and dialogue, I was not able to really keep up, catch up, or understand anything. And so when people say a joke, once people will crack a joke, 
that I didn't think was funny or really didn't understand, I would just laugh in order to try to fit in. Uh, when they talk about movies, I'm not a movie buff. I really don't watch movies, I watch a lot of TV in a sense. Um, I watch my little shows. And the shows that I watched growing up was not really, and even some of the music, I was not exposed to. So when they were talking, I felt like I couldn't really fit in. And so I would try to make things up. But I tell you, the staff at Marquette University, you know, um, Dr. Dr. Knox, Dr. Edwards, Dr. Burkett, um, even Dr. Melchard, um, they were so supportive of me. And they was like, hey, just be you. Just be you. I mean, I never forget. I just, I was in Dr. Knox's office with tears one day. Like, I feel like I just don't belong. And the, the warmth and support that they provided me, I think after my middle of my second year, it was all right. When something was stupid to me or it, it was like, does it make sense? Nope, I don't understand. I, I was okay with not laughing at something. And I think that that has led into my, my time as a, in the military because you know being a, a black male psychologist in the military, it, there's not a lot of folks who look like me, right? Um, you, you know, um, and especially when it comes to leadership leadership roles, you know, they're not, I, there's an, overall, there's a whole bunch, there's not a lot of leaders who look like me either. Um, and also a lot of those leaders, I don't speak their language, I don't speak their language either because they're, they're war fighters. Um, they're, you know, their, their training is totally different than my training as a medical provider. Right. But having went through that and overcame that or overcome that, I've realized like, hey, I, I, I know my role here. And I think what you just said is, you know, understanding what your role and becoming comfortable, 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 comfortable in that role allows you to get over the imposter syndrome. So so I think my next question for you, because um, talk, I'm talking too much, is what is how has your experience been your internship or residency in the Air Force? So. What was that like for you um, in the Air Force? Yeah, my internship and residency was, was phenomenal. So, so Claimer, uh, in the military, we call it, it it's, it's your pre-doctoral internship, I guess, uh, civilian, but in military, we call it residency. So yeah, in my residency, I went to June Base Andrews, uh, Malcolm Grove Medical Clinics and Surgery Center in Washington, D.C. area. And it was phenomenal. Like I, I loved, number one, I loved Washington, D.C. because it reminded me of like Chicago. And just the people there, I already knew people that lived there. Right. So I was able to hang out with some friends and the area, it just, it just felt like home. So the area was just phenomenal for me, um, but also just the experience that I got in residency was, you know, exceptional as well. So I was able to do different rotations, you know, obviously during internship, you do like a uh, different rotations to learn more about the different domains of psychology. Um, so, you know, clinical health psychology, neuropsychology, et cetera. But the most, interesting rotation for me was the ones that I got to choose and got to seek out. And I, so I chose for, for me to have like a specialty rotation and it was me working at the uh, uh, DHA. Mm. And, and ultimately I was able to understand more about policy, you know, and how changing policy pretty much, you know, shows changes everything you do on the, on the ground. Right? right. When it comes to, you know, things we do in the clinic, you know, the procedures that we follow, et cetera. So I was able to work with, you know, very high ranking individuals and actually helped work on a policy for the public health service. Okay. Um, and, and we put that up for publication and it was really cool to see what they do in day to day and be able to just change the like uh, systemic, you know, challenges that I saw and, and right. barriers, you know, that ultimately once you change the system, then that ultimately helps everything else. Okay. And so I really, I really enjoyed that. That was probably the most enjoyable experience in residency okay. uh, outside of just living in the area and being with uh, some, some friends and, you know, and having my, my wife with me as well. So, yeah. Yeah. And also it, it's just cool, like being in the, you know, supporting the presidential support mission. So I thought that was just really cool. You know, I got to see like Air Force One. I got to, you know, go to the Pentagon. I got to go to the White House. Like I've seen nice. all those things. It was really cool. Nice. Too. nice. Um, so, so it's interesting because I know the Air Force, you guys call your internship residency mm. and the Army, our predoctoral, uh, what is it, predoctoral internship um, is our, uh, they call it clinical psychology internship program. And so I, so as a, you know, PhD person, counseling psychology PhD person, and I take offense to that. I'm like, I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm a, I'm a licensed counseling psychologist, right? Um, but 
our internship, we call it internship that first year. And then once we complete our internship and then year two, we have the option of year two is our fellowship slash residency where we get, you know, advanced um, clinical experience. Um, so, so in the army, we call ours internship first year, and then second year residency is our like our 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 postdoc. Postdoc, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And it's interesting about the the counseling or clinical psychology. So I can I'll call even though I have a PhD in counseling psychology, I call myself a clinical psychologist because that's what it says on my licensure. So I'm licensed in the state of Virginia. So state of Virginia, gotcha. you're a licensed clinical psychologist. That's what it says on my big plaque I have in my office. So really, uh, that, that's that's why I call myself a licensed clinical psychologist. Yeah. Okay, interesting, interesting. So, so I think, other states may be different how they how they yeah. label so, that. So Colorado, I did, it just says licensed psychologist. Uh, so my PhD is in counseling psychology, so it's a licensed psychologist. So I always just say I'm a licensed counseling psychologist because uh, I'm I'm actually in the I'm, I'm trying to get my board certification in counseling psychology as well. Um, mm -hmm. But it's another thing I've been approach avoidant. So if my um, ABIP uh, mentor hears this, she'll probably say, hey, you have time to do the podcast, but you don't have time to finish your application, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I'm, that, that is on my to-do thing for to-do list for this year, really, because I really want to become a board certified um, counseling psychologist. I just feel like I owe that back to Marquette because they invested a lot in me and took a chance on me. Um, I, I don't know. Just, you know, I want to continue to pay debt back to Marquette. You see, it's out of all my three degrees, I got Marquette on my wall. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's cool. So how has your, you know, active duty experience? So like my, a little bit mine, right? So I, once I left internship in my postdoc at Fort Sam Houston, uh, Brook Harbor Medical Center, um, I did a lot of different wonderful rotations. Um, and I, I had struggled with rotation. Neuropsych rotation was, was a struggle for me, um, partly because I struggled in neuropsychology course at Marquette with Dr. Young. Um, Dr. Young is a phenomenal professor. It's just that I think I, that's where I really realized what imposter syndrome was because working, reading Luria's The Working Brain um, was like reading Greek. I just didn't understand any of it. Um, but now as I look back on it, it's like, wow, I've come so far because I understand the, the neural anatomy a whole lot more. Um, and then so fellowship, one of the interesting experiences I had was working in a primary health clinic and getting a certification to become an internal behavioral health consultant, a level three. So that was real cool. But then once I left, I went to Alaska to be a brigade psychologist. So not you know, I worked in the clinic, but I was more operational where, you know, you're the brigade commander's consultant for all things behavior health. So the surgeon section, um, when they're doing behavior health planning, they're coming to you. So you get a chance to, at a brigade level, really work on policy. So I did that for three years. Um, and then after, after I left there, I uh, PCS to Fort, Fort Hood um, in 20. 2019, and then from there, I was here what seven months before I deployed overseas in the support of an operational or rotational, a NATO rotational mission um, in Eastern Europe, which was amazing. Being over there for nine months um, in a in a rotational deployed environment, uh, people you know say it's not combat. Well, being away from your family for nine months, um, it, it you know it's different. It's a different type of combat. Um, so, Grant, I got a chance to explore eight different countries, got plenty of passports, <laughs> passport stamps. Um, I worked my tail off for nine months and then came back and I'm, I left the, the brigade and now I'm the division psychologist, uh, which is like my dream army job. So it's one of the things I wrestle with, like what's next? Because about this is, you know, leaving this position, I go back to a hospital somewhere in a hospital clinic and um, I'm gonna struggle with, I will struggle with that. But I have 16 years in the military all together now. Um, so, just trying to, how do I finish this little, this, this, this home run stretch in a sense, right? In, in order to move on to the next phase of my career, whether it's in four years or the next nine years, four years, if I go back to the reserve, nine years, I stay on active duty, but still, still the home stretch. Um, but I got, again, 16 years in. So how has your, your, your duty assignment, because I know you're out in what, New Mexico, no, yeah, New Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. So how is that? And what are some things that you do? So here I'm the director of psychological health. So it seemed like very equivalent to what you mentioned, what you did in Alaska. So I'm like the main psychology consultant for what we call the wing commander here in the Air Force. Um, so I do a lot of outreach. Like I have 
you know, days blocked off in my schedule in which I just do outreach. Okay. You know, so I do a lot of public speaking, you know, just try to improve unit wellness. And I run group therapy. I do individual therapy. And, and, and ultimately, um, I, I get to change up my days, but every day looks a little bit different, you know, so it, keep, it keeps it, you know, exciting. Yeah. So, yeah, thus far, yeah, I really enjoy my time here. I've been here a year and a half thus far. So I have uh, two more years left in my contract um, because I'm HPSB at the end of the year. So I have, I have two years left. And then so I'll stay here during those two years. And after that, I plan to get out. And I started my own consulting company uh, recently. So I want to do that full time. So, OK. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Um, and and I, man, we've been talking 51 minutes into it. So, um, I just got one question I want to ask before we kind of wrap it up. Um, so that way you can go on with your evening. Um, have you, uh, it's something I, I really haven't talked with anybody about. Um, being a black psychologist, I, I tend to, and in the military, I tend to, um, I see a lot of people, right? But a lot of the enlisted soldiers and a lot of people, my dissertation was on help seeking behaviors of African-American males currently incarcerated, right? People who experience different symptoms of depression, not saying they were depressed, but symptoms of depression, but who did not want to reach, you know, did not want to follow up with treatment. So help seeking behavior is something that is real dear to me, uh, especially for black males. I, I found being a black male in the military and once people find that you're approachable, they're more willing to talk to you. And then I've had, you know, black service members, or even sometimes Hispanic service members, or different people, service members of color, come to me and say, you know, I really appreciate that you, you're, 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 I got a chance to talk to somebody who understands me, right? And that that's very complex and complicated. Understands because I don't, I can't really understand everybody's struggle or their experiences because they everybody walks their own, um, their own path in life, right? So it's, I don't think no two people can ex really share each other struggle or experience. Um, because I think it takes away from that person's true experience and feelings for their experience. However, you can have some level of empathy, um, having potentially gone through your own different struggle. And I think we all struggle regardless of, and regardless of ethnicity. Um, but I get that a lot, right? And I really feel appreciative of that. And sometimes I get people who have never really been around people of color in a very, in a helping way, who need to see, talk to someone like me, but won't talk to someone like me because of my color, right? And I, sometimes I have to work a little harder for them to see that I'm also approachable and they can't talk to me. Um, have you ever experienced anything like that? So for your first thing that you mentioned, you know, about individuals of color being able to feel more comfortable around me, I've definitely seen that. You know, when I do outreach and I show my face and I show who I am, I've had just recently another black male come up to me and say, wow, I didn't even realize there was another black male psychologist. I didn't even know you have black male psychologists here. Yeah. You know, then he was like, hey, how can I schedule an appointment with you? You know, so if I didn't go out there and do that outreach and show my face, then he probably wouldn't have got that care that he needed, right. you know? And so being able to to just, uh, number one, just showing outreach and, and destigmatizing, you know, mental health. A lot of people of color feel a little bit more comfortable because if they, if they just want to talk to a person of color as well. Uh, and then also with your other aspect that you mentioned, I don't, I don't know if I can think of a time in which someone directly didn't want to talk to me just because, you know, I was a maybe a black male, but I've had multiple experiences in which, you know, maybe women didn't want to talk to another male, right. you know, um, and, and then I have some individuals that experience, you know, I experience like microaggressions within the therapy setting. You know, uh, when they when they talk about people of color that identify as a, a the white person, right? You know, so I've experienced that, but um, yeah, I haven't. Yeah, it makes me because of my gender. Uh, there's right. some individuals, you know, uh, who may not feel comfortable talking to me. Yeah, man, you're gonna stop talking, man. Cause you're gonna keep triggering these questions, right? Because when you said the last statement, saying you know the microaggressions um, in the in the therapy realm, um, I, I've got a lot of times people assume, right, because I'm a, I'm a black male, well, I'm an officer in the military, uh, and I'm a, that I don't experience, or I haven't experienced, or I can't relate to some of the social issues that we see, see in, the, in this country. And they'll say, well, you're from Compton, and you're an officer, but you're black. I, you know, what do you think about that? <laughs> and I was like, mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sometimes I have to really catch myself, mm. because um 
I, I've been racial, racially profiled while wearing a uniform. <laughs> um, and, and so I kind of, that's a fine balance for me. And sometimes I try to stay away from those conversations unless I get the sense, of the, the intuition that this person is, is really willing to hear what I have to say and will be able to appreciate what I say. If not, I don't really waste my time and my energy because I think um, it, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not fair to me to waste my energy when I don't think people are going to receive what I'm going to tell them because, um, yeah, so anyway, anyway, I don't want to go into that. That's a whole different <laughs> topic. Sure, sure. Yeah, definitely understand what you mean. Though. Yeah. Uh, you have any questions for me, Ryan? Yeah, so I know you said you, you plan to stay in, you know, for maybe the next four to nine years. What, what are your plans like after, whenever you do choose to retire? Yeah, man, so um, I do want to start my own practice, right? Well, I ain't gonna say start my own practice. I do want to fulfill and take my practice to, to the next level, right? So before I even came out to duty, um, I had my, my community agency dedicated to achieving dreams. So, um, you know, dedicated for the Darnell, achieving for my middle initial, archery and then dreams for my last name Duraw. Um, and, and I want to do more things in the community. And I think even now, you know, people like people, you know, I would say you've inspired me, you know, Earl's inspired me. Um, you know, my psychology buddy out in Oakland's inspired me and some of my my other friends who are entrepreneurs or who are inspiring me to say, you know, don't sit on your dream now. You can start doing those things that you want to do now. So therefore, when you do, whenever that time is to walk away from the military, you're walking to something that's already already established, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I really want to do. I really want to. I want to have my community agency where, um, you know, I'm helping other clinicians do what they love to do, right? So I love being a clinician, but I also love managing. I love managing and connecting people. So I want to connect and manage, you know, clinicians with the community members who need them. Um, I want to offer services, you know, you know, I used to do anger management, you know, classes in the community for people who are on probation and parole through state and federal, pro, you know, all state and federal probation. I want to start doing that again. So I think even now active duty, one of the things I'm going to start doing is, is having webinars where people can, you know, get some of these services online now. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, so that's what I want. I really want to take that to the next level, Ryan. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a passion of mine and go out and just speak about, you know, seeking help and really talk about help seeking um, for, for, especially for men of color. So um, I think that's important. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, whenever, you know, you, you get that going, I'll be interested in, you know, attending. So definitely shoot me that information. I will, I will. I, I appreciate it, man. So, um, but but yeah, so that, that's that, that's that. Well, I really appreciate it, Ryan. Um, um, thanks for, 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 for coming on and, we the more people have just more resources and options 